So have you ever looked at a picture of space and wondered how do they get that amazing detail and color? Just how does it look so good? Well, in reality, those pictures don't really always look like that. In fact, they don't look like that at all. They only look like that if we use our skills to make that image look that certain way. Even though space is full of beautiful things in space, to our eyes, they don't really look like that at all, if we can even see it ourselves. In today's video, I'm gonna be myth-busting a common misconception for astrophotography and a lot of space pictures to a lot of people who think that a lot of these images we are getting just come out just like that right as we get the picture and that is just not true. So come along with me as I photograph the bubble nebula tonight and show you what space really looks like through my telescope. This is Tanner from AstroTan and welcome to the YouTube channel. For starters, getting a beautiful, colorful image of, let's say, the Andromeda Galaxy could actually be fairly easy depending on where you are. A lot of things come into play like location, your light pollution, and the equipment that you're using to get an image such as that. But a lot of other things come into play like filters, which I'll explain a little bit later. But when we are getting our actual images of space, we need to take exposures of this, and that means pointing our camera and telescope at this object for a long period of time and then putting those pictures all together in a stacking software to reveal a lot of the details we don't see in a single exposure. So if you're catching on, that's exactly what everybody does, including NASA and James Webb. They stack their images together to bring out more detail. Have you ever wondered why NASA just doesn't keep their telescopes down on Earth? Why would it be such a big deal to put them in space? Well, this is where our first factor comes in, the atmosphere. The atmosphere really determines how blurry or sharp you want your image to be. So let's take for example if you're shooting through a wobbly atmosphere and I said this in my first video but I didn't really say it in an orderly fashion I use the example of looking through water and if you're looking through water and there's ripples in the water that is exactly what our atmosphere will be like when you're taking pictures in a wobbly atmosphere you'll notice a lot of distortion and blurriness as if you're looking to see something through the water that is exactly how our atmosphere is down on earth especially for an average person who lives in a home and in a neighborhood like this unless you are living somewhere with a higher altitude, you will not really have a beneficial atmosphere unless the atmosphere is just naturally not as turbulent as it would be normally. When you shoot through a really good atmosphere, that means when the atmosphere is really still and you're able to see through that water, I guess, really perfectly, you will have a really sharp image of space. Your images will appear a lot sharper and more detailed in comparison to if you were shooting somewhere where the seeing is not that good. And that is what atmospheric turbulence is. It is also called atmospheric seeing. So obviously there's no atmosphere in space, at least I don't think there is. And that is exactly why we put these telescopes into space. These are called space telescopes, and this will ensure that we get the most detail possible because we're not shooting through any atmosphere. So there will be no wobble, there will be no blurriness, it will be just as sharp as it appears in the image itself. The second reason why space pictures are a common misconception is through the use of filters. Filters are very, very vital and very, very important when taking a astronomical image. The whole kind of system of taking a astrophotography shot is really in an orderly fashion. You wanna make sure that if you're getting a good image, you might need to use a filter, or if you're using a mono camera, you need to use RGB filters. Tonight, I will be using the Optolong L Enhance, which is a dual narrowband filter, and this will help me isolate the light pollution and the moonlight from my image, and this is a extremely powerful filter. This filter is not designed for daytime photography, and if you really put this on your camera, you would see a lot of green and purple, and why would it look like that? So the glass inside this filter is designed for isolating the HA and O3 bandwidths of light, which is the red and blue color that I am going for in this image tonight. If we isolate those two nebulae gases, there won't be anything else that I will need to take a picture of in that nebula itself. So I'll be just getting rid of all of that light pollution. I will not have to worry about the moon because this filter will block all of it out and I will not have to deal with it when I'm editing my image. If you're using a black and white camera, obviously you can't get a color image if it is a black and white camera. So how do you solve this? If you're using a mono camera, you need to get RGB filters and take images 
separately with each filter. Now I'm not a monochrome user and monochrome cameras are much better at getting pictures of space. They have better signal to noise ratio and they will also get more signal itself. So what you would need to do is get a filter wheel or filter drawer to take images of red, images of green, and images of blue. Just the entire thing, red, green, or blue, and then put it together once you're editing your image. So I hope you're catching on that this is not just a point and shoot hobby. At least I hope you are. And for the final thing I want to talk about, and this is the most important thing of all, the exposures themselves. So if you were to just find a telescope, just a really big astrophotography setup, and just snap that picture right there, what would you see? Well, depending on your location, it could be really different. If you were in, let's say, Las Vegas, right in the middle of the city itself, the city of lights, and you were to just literally take a picture of a deep sky object with an astrophotography setup without any filter, what would you see? Well, if you were looking at a nebula, you would probably see absolutely nothing. Yeah, I'm being dead serious, you would absolutely see nothing. And that is because space is extremely faint. Yes, extremely faint. If you're wondering if you could see any of these nebulae or galaxies with our own eyes, you would be wrong there too. Space and nebulae emit wavelengths of light that our eyes are not able to see, so cameras take care of that job for us. Cameras are a lot more sensitive to light than our eyes are, so they're able to get those wavelengths of light with relative ease in comparison to our own eyes. If you've ever looked at the Orion Nebula 3 telescope, it is still absolutely amazing. But sadly, you will be a little bit distraught because you won't be able to see all of that really cool purple and orange and red color, or even the blue color, that is visible in all these amazing pictures of the Orion Nebula. Now, let's say that you brought a setup like this to a dark sky site and snapped a picture of, let's say, a nebula. What would you see then? Well, you would probably see a lot, actually. You would probably see a lot of nebula structure if it's a bright nebula. But even if it's a faint nebula, you would not really be able to see much. Even if your skies are really dark, let's say you're shooting from a dark sky part, you will still, and I'm being serious, you will still not be able to see as much. And this is why exposures and stacking count so much. I can't stress this enough, space is actually really, really faint sometimes. If we were able to grab an image of a nebula in such high detail and resolution like we normally would see in all these awesome space pictures, that nebula would have to be really, really bright. It's exactly why we don't see all that nebulae in our night sky itself. Well, that also comes into play with other things too, like light pollution and other factors. But if every nebula was as bright as, let's say the Orion Nebula, which is visible to the naked eye, we would be able to see it everywhere. Even though we see the Milky Way, a lot of that is from nearby stars that are so compact together that they form a huge cloud of just streamline over the night sky. So even though I would want to see all those nebulae in the night sky there, they're just not bright enough. So that is why we take long exposures, or that's why we call it long exposure astrophotography. Long exposure astrophotography refers to taking long, long exposures of space. So what is an exposure exactly? An exposure is how long your camera shutter is open to taking a picture before it is closed. Now, a regular phone, or let's say you're using an app called Snapchat, if you're clicking that button to take that picture, it comes automatically right there and then. But if you're a deep sky astrophotographer, it might take 30 to even 10 minutes. Because space is actually so faint, we need to gather a lot of light in a single exposure before we can really stack everything together. If we take too short of an exposure, it will actually appear almost like a video, and we will not be able to get a lot of that detail we need a long exposure to get a really base level or foundation exposure time to get a lot of those details. Once we get a foundation of details, we will then take a lot of those and that will help boost the nebula detail while reducing a lot of the noise. So now that we've talked about what really needs to happen to build an image such as the ones that we see all over social media, let's talk a little bit about the target that I'll be shooting tonight, the bubble nebula. Oh, I thought I would mention that I'm wearing a sweatshirt. You guys know what that means. It means it is cold. It is cold, cold, cold. 
and well it's not that cold but i still like it anyway so tonight i will be shooting the bubble nebula and i have been super excited to shoot this target for ages and even last year i really wanted to do this target and it's probably one of my favorite targets even though i've only shot it literally none i've I've never shot this target before, but somehow it's still my favorite. Yeah, it beats me, man. I'm a weird the guy. The Bubble Nebula's scientific name is NGC7635, and I don't call it that. Please don't call it that. You might get some people scared of you. But it is an HA emission nebula that is perfect for the setup that I will be using tonight, which is the setup I use for every single night. It's located in the constellation of Cassiopeia, and it sits fairly high in the night sky for me in my northern hemisphere skies. It won't really be a challenging target, but it won't be easy. It's kind of in that moderate brightness level, so that means it's not too, too faint, but it's also not too, too bright. I'll probably have to spend a couple days on it, honestly, and I will not be objected to that because I do have unobstructed skies, and you guys already know that. I don't have to talk about it anymore, but the weather is looking great out here for some astrophotography tonight, and I'm super excited to get things started. I'm going to use the setup right behind me just as usual. Starting from the top down I have my ZWO ASI 120MC and that is mounted onto my guide camera which is just an SV Boney 50mm guide scope. That's to really help my tracking accuracy on my mount and so I can get those long exposures nice and sharp. Next up I have the SV Boney SV503 80mm ED doublet refractor. Yeah that's a long name. And this is my main imaging refractor that I'll be using to get my image of the bubble nebula tonight. Sitting on the back I have my Player One Artemis C Pro which is my main dedicated astronomy camera that I'll be using to take the pictures of the nebula itself tonight. And sitting right in front of that I have the Optolong L Enhance which is that filter that I was talking about earlier. It's all mounted on the trusty old iOptron GEM28 that I got last year back in May and it is outstanding. It has never failed me once. Yeah, that's a lie. That is a lie. But really, really, it's a good mount. I promise, I promise. So guys, if you have a question about this mount, come talk to me. Later on, I'm going to be showing you guys the individual exposures that I get of the Bubble Nebula before I reveal my final image of the Bubble Nebula. I want you guys to see what I'm really talking about. Even though I'm really talking about it, I want you guys to see it firsthand with your eyes. So I'll be showcasing the five minute exposure that I got and what it really does to combine all those five minute exposures into one image to show you how good the signal to noise ratio can really improve when you combine all those images together. It's kind of crazy how the whole thing works and it's kind of like a cheat code if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> so yeah guys, that's what we're going to do. It's getting dark. It's almost time to pull our line the mount and uh, yeah, it's going to be a great night guys. It's going to be a great one. you guys we are currently up and running on the bubble nebula and it is freezing it's probably about i must say probably like 45 degrees outside right now so i'm about to show you guys what an individual exposure looks like of the bubble nebula and it is not what you think so individual exposure coming in right about now all right so have a good look at that individual exposure now what do you see well you probably see a lot of green you might see a little bit of stars. So what is that green really from? That green is from the filter itself. Yeah, the filter makes everything look green. It doesn't make necessarily everything look green. There is a lot of signal deep inside that picture. If we do something called a background extraction, we will be able to get rid of all of that green and see what exactly the filter provided for us in that exposure. So now you're about to see what it looks like with a background extracted single exposure of the bubble nebula. Three, two, one, 
and boom. All right, so there you go. That was what was actually in that individual exposure. So, so you can probably see a few details and it looks really cool even with an individual exposure. But just imagine what you could see from many exposures put together. It'll be like a 20 hour exposure. That's basically what it really means. When we combine these pictures together, it would be like if we took a 20 hour exposure. And that's what I'm shooting for tonight. I'm shooting for 20 hours of exposure time combining all these i'm going to be doing five minute subs and it's going to be great so doing this for a couple nights it's going to be awesome well i hope this video brought some light to the misconception about astrophotography and what really needs to happen to get a good image of space itself to get these nebulae pictures there really is a lot that you have to do and it costs a lot of money especially and you need to have a lot of knowledge in order to really process your image well. That's another thing. In order to get such a good picture such as the ones you see, you have to have a lot of good processing skills and that will involve boosting different channels of light and making sure they blend all well in a single image itself. If you're using a mono camera or you're getting pictures separately, like let's say you're getting broadband or you're getting just unfiltered images and then you're doing images with a filter and you put those together you have to make sure that you blend those really nicely and then you will have a really nice image of whatever you were shooting and this is going to conclude it for the video it's time for the image reveal of the bubble nebula and i'll see you guys later clear skies